Hi. Oh, <laughs> did was it the link that you used that got you? In? The, it, okay. it kept putting in my email and it wouldn't accept my email. Okay. Oh, weird. Oh, uh, they, they kept telling me go put your register. I said, but it's telling me I'm not registered. So anyhow. Weird. Okay. That was scary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Is Nathan here? No, he's not either. Oh. But okay. hopefully he will be soon. Well, smooth sailing. Now I've learned a lesson. <laughs> yeah. Why thought I was registered. And I, yeah, I did think like I thought of reminding you to register, but I thought like he well they did send that you know like the checklist, but yeah. this is the thing I thought well but since we've done this we're on top of it and I thought the check you know anyhow yeah yeah because they had that meeting with us so yeah it seems like After the meeting I thought we knew how to do this no problem but but uh, I don't know the simplest thing the first thing on their checklist was register <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm really, really pleased this worked. But I hope Nathan joins. Okay, let me tell you, which session are you trying to join? Okay, okay. so we got people on it, but now I'm saying, I'm in, I'm in. Oh, yeah, she'll let them. So apparently they can only have 300 people in a room, which is quite a lot. Um, so we'll see. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I hope there's not that many though, but well, I mean, I kind of hope there are. Also not. I'll let Nathan know that you're in. So are we supposed to in admit people? Uh, I'm not sure. I kind of assumed that was the moderator's job, but I, yeah, I guess, I don't know. Still have a few minutes. Oh, there he is. There's Nathan. Hey, folks. Sorry about that. I'm running a little late, but you got in a conference attendee. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all right. Yeah, Carl, maybe you can change your name. Uh, I think you can. You might be able to change it. So are you all going to be um, doing your own slides? Is that yeah. all right? You can do that. Yeah. Okay. And you're, are you comfortable with sharing the screen? Yes, I'll do that right now. Yeah, okay, okay. That's great. It? Oh, looks great, looks great. Um, I will, don't, you'll see um, pop-ups here. Oh, I'm gonna, oh, whatever. I'm the worst at this. Okay, uh, can I, let's see here, hold on a second. Um, So, who do do do? I'm trying to think. Um, oh, good, we have our captioner. So, and he's been assigned. It looks like who started this session? Was that? Oh, that was me. Should I make you the host? Would you? That'd be great. Yes. 
you can, um, yeah, you probably should from the drop down, like next to my name under participants, there should okay, be yes. more, and you can do that. Yeah, you should be the host now. But I think I can am. you make I am. You're great. Can you make me the co-host though? Because yeah, I think course. I lost that. Oh, you lost that. That's weird. Okay, you're good. And yeah. good. Okay. And then it looks like our capture has been assigned. So that is good. And um, we are recording, so that's all right. Um, I will then monitor the chat and I will I will admit people into the room. So don't even, don't worry about that. Um, okay. You'll see those notices pop up on your screen, but just just carry on. Sorry, okay. you're asking something. No, um, I was just asking about ad admitting people to the room. So you just you just told us you're okay. taking care of that. We're just talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's all you're doing. Just do your thing. Um, don't worry about it. I will. I'll follow the, the questions in the chat. So if something gets lost or whatever, I can bring it up. And then um, sometimes links get buried. <coughs> I'll, re I'll repost them. That's not a big deal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Heather, did yeah, you have good something? Good morning, everybody. Yeah, Heather uh -huh. here, uh, here to help you with any troubleshooting, and I'll be staying on the meeting with you as well um the one thing i see that um i think we still need to do a uh, map our captioner um is assigned as a captioner but nathan i think is the host you need to go and select him okay so maybe i was for the I... captioning option to appear Okay, so I thought he had been assigned and it, okay, but I've assigned him now, so we should be good. Yeah, that's the way we we were told it was supposed to work. And unfortunately we've been finding that the host is still having to assign captioning missions, so. <laughs> I, I just saw his name under there and I thought that we were good to go, but okay, I've got him now, we're good. Um, okay. I think we're, Good. Um, are there, did y'all have any other questions, Sarah, Carl? Well, nope. I'm just going to say we are going to try to stay under 25 minutes. So hopefully we'll have Q&A at the end. But um, yeah, we'll see what happens. All right. Um, and I'll just read your uh, bios from the, from the program. That's all right. Good. Um, I'm excited to hear this. I was just in the OER beginners, and there were some folks asking for language resources, and I was like, uh, y'all should come to the session. So, yeah, thanks. Um, all right, let's see here. Okay, Matthew's ready, and we've got one more minute. So, so I'll do a brief introduction and um, remind everyone about the captions, and then um, and the recording, and. Um, and then you go, I'll hand it over. Thank you. All right, we are at 10 o'clock. I'm going to admit everyone. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the first section session of the final day of Open Texas 2021. Um, I, I wanted to just remind you all that uh, this session is being recorded. Um, there are also live captioning um, at the that is available to you. If you are not seeing the captions and you'd like to see them, you should have a little CC button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll, I'll be monitoring that and there will be time for Q&A at the end of the session. Um, and so without any further delay, I wanna introduce our speakers. We have Sarah Sweeney, who is the project coordinator for the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, CORAL, at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, she holds degrees in French and global communication, enjoys teaching, uh, learning and teaching languages, 
has worked on marketing communications, education, and online projects in various fields. Carl Blythe is the director of, the, of CORAL and an associate professor of French linguistics in the Department of French and Italian. He has held several administrative positions prior to CORAL and um, worked with colleagues on, on online conference grammar and French and multimedia-based first-year French programs. So you all are in good hands. I will now turn it over to our speakers. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so the title of our talk is the OER Lifecycle, Guiding Faculty Members Through the Process of OER Development. Uh, so let's begin with our logo. This is our logo for CORAL, the Center for OER and Language Learning, and that's our intersection. We essentially produce OER for foreign language learning in the context of American higher education. Next slide, please. Uh, CORAL is one of 16 National Foreign Language Resource Centers. We're on a grant right now. Uh, we're in our uh, one more year of our grant cycle. And the grant, of course, is from the, Univer um, the, the US Department of Education. Uh, we won our first grant in 2010. So we've been in operation for a decade now and have produced uh, OER in foreign languages in 20 different languages. We have hundreds of OER. Um, as I said, we're located at the University of Texas at Austin. We work with faculty here, but we also work with faculty around the country. And now we are happy because there's another uh, um, resource center under the same grant uh, that also uh, focuses on open education, and that's the OLRC at the University of Kansas. So uh, the focus of our talk is, is this notion of the OER life cycle and how we can apply it to working with faculty. So what is the life cycle? Well, uh, in a paper in 2008, Seth Gorell, who was an OER advocate at, at the time at the university, uh, I believe it was Utah State, uh, talked about, adopted this kind of biological metaphor for discussing the development of OER. And the idea, of course, is that one generation of OER will beget the next generation in this process of endless improvement. Um, so this evolutionary cycle. Uh, but he said it starts kind of with, a, with a, a faculty member who finds a gap really in their materials or in their curricula and then triggers them to find materials or content to fill that gap. Uh, and that leads to a process of then putting together these different objects, composing, uh, and then of course, adapting the materials to make them fit uh, together and adapting them to, the, to their particular uh, lo local um, context. Using of course means bring, in our case, it means bringing it into the classroom or in homework assignments, using it with, with students. And then finally, he said that you want to share that OER back with the community in some kind of publication process so that it can be found and then it starts the cycle anew. Now, um, this notion of a cycle of the, the life cycle of OER has, of course, been used a lot in discussing the development of, of, of the actual product. We are, we've kind of adapted it and thought about it in the um, more in terms of uh, professional development because the, the development of the OER developer. So here's one of our projects called Flight, Foreign Languages and the Literary in the Everyday. Uh, and it's focused on graduate students who are learning about open educational practices. In the flight model, we start with finding a text. So they have to find a um, uh, foreign language text online that they want then to use. Uh, for their classes, they have to read it for the different meaning components. What do they want to focus on? Then they design a lesson around that um, that that open content, that open text. They produce a lesson in some kind of a hard copy. They teach that lesson. Their students give them feedback. They refine that lesson. Then they send it to an editorial board. We actually have faculty members around the country in different languages who will then vet their their lessons. And finally, they revise it for uh, the second time, and then they send it to the publishing, the ar archive, we have an archive where they can publish it uh, and we make sure that it gets disseminated. So that's a little bit more of a granular uh, approach to the life cycle. So how do we use the life cycle, this OER life cycle in interacting with our faculty? So 
yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the specifics of that. Um, each of our projects is a little bit different and we never follow a completely linear process, but um, a few main milestones have emerged that help us manage all of our projects. And these milestones align with the life cycle steps. Um, so first of all, we work with the OER author to look at where OER exists already and see mm -hmm. where there's a need for OER. Uh, then the author wrote, writes a scope and sequence that summarizes what the content will be. And then they organize the content to align with that scope and sequence. So that means they're using found resources and then also creating their own resources. So that's kind of the adaptation step. step. Uh, and then the OER authors pilot the resources over multiple semesters. And this can happen in over different periods of time with formal or informal classes. So like everything takes many different forms. Um, and then finally, we put it out into the world. And sometimes that happens more iteratively, unit by unit. Sometimes we publish everything all at once at the end of the project. So again, there's a lot of variation, but these are the main milestones that we go for. So um, let's make this a little bit more concrete by talking about some case studies. Joanna looks. Uh, this was in 2012, and Joanna at the time was at Cornell University. She was uh, in charge of the, the lower division French program there. And she had just adopted, or she was just using our OER for French, for a beginning French course called Francais Interactif. And uh, after the one semester, she called me up at Coral and she said, I really like it, things are going well, but. And then, of course, she went and talked about the gap that she had found. Uh, she, to her, she said there were a lot of readings in our on our OER, but there weren't enough literary readings. And so she was asking me for permission to create her own literary supplement. I said, of course, go ahead. It's an OER. You're allowed to, to make a derivative or add on to it. That's fine. So she produced uh, she produced a literary lesson for every single chapter. There are 13 chapters and it was quite involved, very sophisticated. She sent me the entire Google Doc and I was really, really impressed by her work, but she had not paid attention to copyright. And so much of the work that she had done, of course, was uh, based on copyrighted materials. And that started a, a year long process where we had to go back through her materials and help her find open equivalents to all the content that she had used. So in working with Joanna, we realized that this was a kind of a professional development, um, a program really that we needed to undertake with all of our faculty members. Um, I can, can I go back just to that slide? So um, we did eventually publish then her OER, which was called Le Littéraire dans le Quotidien, which is then a supplement to Francais Interactif. These two things work together. Um, and it's spun off then in other ways because there are other people who want to do this something similar, but in other languages. So uh, Dr. Christian Hilchi is a little bit different uh, in that he was, here's a, he's a UT faculty member uh, in the Slavic department. And he was hired to take over the Czech program. Uh, UT is one of a few universities that actually has a program in Czech. Um, and uh, he was trained as a linguist. And the first day I remember meeting him, he came into the choral office and he had done his due diligence. He had looked carefully at all the other textbooks out there in the market. And he said they were very traditional. They were very grammar focused. They didn't have any multimedia. And so he, he really wanted to do much better. Um, and in talking with him, I was struck, my background is also in linguistics, and I thought that he was, a, he, um, even though he had, had told me that many of the textbooks out there were very grammar focused, he too was adopting kind of a grammatical terminology and a linguistic point of view. So I encouraged him to create content that also reflected the culture. And he, he, uh, he took some cameras and went to Prague for that summer shot lots of video of native speakers in everyday situations. But at the same time, he, uh, I was encouraging to, to look at, online for user-generated content instead of not just creating his own content, but looking at what Czech speakers were actually doing on the internet. And he came across, he had this kind of epiphany. He discovered this one website by these two Czech, a Czech couple that traveled the world. 
and documented their, their trip in Egypt and Mallorca and Italy and so forth. And what he noticed was that the user generated content was much more international or even transnational. Uh, so that the reality, the Czech reality that he was representing in his materials was still a little bit stereotypic compared to how the native speakers were representing their own lives. So that was a big shift for him. He realized that instead of planning out this scope and sequence, which was quite rigid and often led to kind of stereotypic scenarios to use to find the good content and then figure out ways to, uh, to implement that content content in his program. And that was a big shift for him. Our last example is Dr. Jeanette Okor, uh, the author of Her Shebir Marhaba Ile Bachelar, Everything Begins with a Hello. So this is our most recent project and we uh, just published the textbook and we're working on supplementary materials right now. Um, so this is a textbook for intermediate Turkish language learners. And we began working with Dr. Okor because she's a faculty at the University of Texas. And she first came to us because she was developing this textbook in Google Docs and teaching it with her students, but she wanted to formalize it more and share it with the world. And so I'm contrasting this here with Klika Brazil, which is the textbook project that we did before this Turkish textbook. And so, this kind of helped, this project helped us really realize finally how we wanted to start documenting our process more because um, as we've said again and again, each process is a little different and each project is a little different, um, but we realized that we wanted to have more of a structure for knowing how to predict um, how the projects would be different and what we could expect and so with this Turkish textbook, since it was a newer project, we noticed that we had to go through a lot more copy editing uh, steps and a lot more editing uh, compared to Clica Brazil, which uh, Vivian Flanzer had been using with her students for years before we actually ended up publishing all the documents into our formal textbook. So that was um, just something that brought our attention to all the differences between projects. And then with both of these projects also, we used multiple platforms to publish. So the resources are available in Google Docs, but then we also put them in PDFs. And then we've also published them for print on demand on different platforms. And so that also creates many different steps in the process. And that was something else we had to take into account with the editing and copy editing. And so on that note, um, I'll talk a little bit about more about how we formalized our process and started documenting all of this. So we've created a lot of different documents recently. Three of the main ones are a set of modules to teach educators about using and developing OER. These are public for everyone to access, although they are mainly targeted towards language teachers. Um, we've also written a memorandum of understanding for project directors and Coral to sign. And then lastly, step-by-step uh, -step documentation of CORAL's three-part OER process. And I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that. So this is basically just a Word doc with um, all of our, our whole OER process listed out. Um, I'll go through sort of the main points that came out as we were writing this. So the first phase of this three-phase process is the OER development. And so this goes all the way from the project proposal step to the copy editing corrections. And so if, uh, one thing that really came out as we were documenting this is that we want to formalize the project through different means. So one of the ways we do that is through a project proposal. And we also have this memorandum of understanding that everyone signs just so everyone's on the same page about what the project is actually going to look like. Uh, then we also train a cohort of project directors, uh, OER authors, so everyone gets to meet each other and work all on the same page about OER from the very beginning. Uh, and then another thing that's important about our process is that the prototype that the author comes up with at the very beginning is going to change. And so as we as we develop the resources, things will will get tweaked and um, yeah, so that's just a normal part of the process that we want to work in. And then 
Similar to that, we also want to accommodate differences in the process and in CORAL's involvement. So with some OER authors, they want us to really be involved in every step, and sometimes we're less involved. And so that's just another thing that we want to um, be conscious of. And then the second phase of the OER process is the OER publication. So this goes all the way from just assembling the content, putting it all together, to actually sharing it with the world. And so a few things that came out as we were documenting this was that it's important to a lot of time for all the extra things that you might not think about, like the appendices and acknowledgements and all those uh, things that kind of sometimes you remember as you're finishing everything up. And then we also wanted to make sure to distinguish between copy editing and proofreading. So those can take different forms. Copy editing more would look at the structure of the resources and how things are arranged um, and the stylistic things. And then proofreading will just be more looking for errors. And so, as I mentioned before, with the Turkish textbook, uh, sometimes we need more or less of certain copy editing or proofreading phases. And then uh, another thing we want to remember is that OER always looks different in its final form. So you might think that you're ready to put it out to the world, but once you see it actually printed out in a textbook or published on a website, you'll notice other things that you want to change. So it's good to allot extra time for that. And then the third phase of our OER process is the outreach and dissemination step. So this goes, this is everything that happens post-publication from the launch to tracking the usage and all sorts of other things. So one main thing we wanted to highlight from that phase is uh, that it's important to identify the unique audience that you're sharing your resources with. So looking at your different networks, seeing who might be interested because it kind of varies for every material. And then also talking to the project director about who they think should see it. And then another really important thing is that we wanna be clear about the availability, about everyone's availability post-publication. So that includes Coral's availability to make edits once the resource is published and then the OER author's availability to respond to user queries. So we all wanna be on the same page about what the expectations are after the project finishes. So I'd like to say that um, we've been talking about this OER life cycle and, and what we have done, of course, is do as heavily documented that. So we've, we've come up with these documents that are, are rather granular in our own work process. We are, they are all CC licensed and we're happy to share them. Uh, even though they're focused on the production of foreign language content, we think that uh, other people might be able to use them and adapt them to their own workflow. So if you would like uh, to see any of these documents, please just give us an email and we'll send them to you or send you the links to them, including our, um, our modules, which are, again, rather, they're focused on, on foreign language teaching, but um, the content uh, is generic and uh, is really applicable to open education at large. So the uh, next next uh, slide. Uh, and so there are our, the, our emails. Please contact us. We're also on Twitter. Um, and please visit our website. We have, as I said, content or OER in 20 different languages. <clears throat> Some of them are um, enormous websites that are, are, are very large uh, OER and some of them are quite small so it, it kind of runs the gamut. Thank you so much for listening and uh, I guess we have a couple of minutes for some questions. I did see in the chat somebody asked a question about English. Um, because of our grant from the U.S. Department of Education our focus is on foreign language uh, foreign languages as defined by the, uh, the Department of Education. So at uh, currently we do not have materials in ESL, um, although um, we would like to, but um, that's one of these things that we have to negotiate with our grantors, uh, uh, Department of Ed. There was another question in the chat, but I think you may have addressed it in the presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about maybe some of the interaction that faculty developers have with say course designers or librarians and, and all of that? Uh, Sarah, you wanna start? 
Yeah, sure. So it, that, again, like everything else we talked about in the process, sort of depends on the project. Um, we actually have started getting more involved with the librarians at UT, and we're in an OER working group together. And so I think um, it's maybe going to be more uh, more collaborative from now on. But I think a lot of times the in the past, we haven't worked with the librarians. That was maybe something that the um, that the project directors would do, but we didn't have much contact with them, but uh, that's starting to change and the librarians know about all of our new projects now. And uh, as far as course designers, there are, uh, Coral is part of liberal arts instructional technology services at the University of Texas at Austin. And that's really helpful because they have a lot more services for um, like Canvas support and things like that. So uh, usually, and they're very visible in, the community so all the uh, faculty members usually interact with them at some point and we can also ask them questions so it's kind of um they're not always involved from the very beginning but there's always a lot of consultation going on with them too and just to add on to what sarah said so we have tried to work more closely with librarians in in the ut library system um the other part of your question was then oer developers working with course developers in this, in our um, situation, they're really one and the same. Most of the OER developers are actually teaching the courses. So if they're developing uh, materials in Czech, then they're typically professors of Czech or they're, they're, they're like in the case of, of all three of these people, they were the directors of their language program. So French, Czech and Turkish. And, and that's, I think, a very important point because all of our materials kind of grow up organically from the, uh, the local conditions. And um, it, it is important to, I think, to do a kind of a needs analysis of understanding what, what, what are the needs of your students and then respond to them with an OER. And another thing too, we didn't really mention as much here, but uh, grad students have also been really yeah. integral to the process as well. And that's kind of good professional development for them, but also um, they always have lots of good ideas. And so that's another important contribution. Yeah. We had a, um, a question about the MOU um, and what the sort of when you talk about um, outreach and dissemination, um, is it clear? Do you have to do uh, is there clarifications about like availability for edits and things like that? In other words, is the author compelled to to continue editing the, the work they produce after it's been published? I think that's the question. Yeah, that is included in the MOU, and uh, I mean, not in much detail, but we basically say that at the end of our grant cycle, we're not really available to like do huge edits, but we can work with them to to make tweaks to the materials. I don't know if you yeah. have anything to and, add, Carl. And that's a very ambiguous area because most of these grants, uh, which fund an OER, um, the, the whole point of OER is that they live, they continue to live on. That's the notion of the life cycle or this evolutionary process. So, um, but yet we as an entity, as an organization, we have funds that only last for certain, for four years, right? So we can't uh, commit ourselves to this endless process of editing their OER. So that's one of the things that we need to get on the table right away. And I find that the MOU, the whole point is to raise these issues that are somewhat ambiguous and that need to be talked about, such as the choice of their um, CC license, because a lot of the um, developers, the faculty developers are not particularly well versed in CC licenses. And this puts this on their radar right from the beginning. And so the MOU in a way raises these issues and they think, I don't know that much about this. And then that's of course where we point them to the modules that we've created to give them a crash course on open educational practices. So the documents kind of create this ecology where one document leads into the next document. That's a great answer. And I so there's a couple other questions in the chat that I'm I'm happy to allow our presenters to answer if they would like, but I do want to recognize that we are at the end of the time for this session. And so if you need to go on to another session, you're free to leave at this point because you give yourself uh, five minutes to, um, to transition. Um, but if the presenters are willing, um, there's a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, 
some some questions. I think you've said this, and I'm I'm going to try to find the link, or maybe you have it handy to the modules that you just described, because there's some questions from folks who are interested in understanding um, how to implement this kind of thing at their own campus when they where they don't have experts who've gone through this process themselves. Yeah, I just include included the modules link in the chat. Excellent, and. And then what, what do you think are the big challenges that people ought to, ought to answer um, as, uh, you know, or ought to be aware of if they're embarking on a project like this? Well, there are oh. lots of challenges. And it, again, it, what we're, one of the themes that we're stressing is that we, we gave, had three little vignettes because they all have very different issues they all had different levels of awareness of open education. So that's become much more of our focus is to train people in say CC licenses or to train them even in, in how to find content on the web. Um, open educational practices is something that now we talk about and make much more explicit with our faculty members. Before in the, in the first generation of our, grant, of our first grant cycle, we partnered with the, um, our faculty members, but we did a lot of that work ourselves. And um, we didn't always insist that they select with us the licenses, but now I think we insist much more on training them in the in OER basics. And um, I, I should say that people like Christian Hilchey, for example, <clears throat> um, they've become wonderful spokespeople for open education. And, and have really developed uh, amazing skills in, in this particular area. So I think that our shift in focus has been much more on, on training than it has been on just production, which is kind of what, where we started. So in a way, our shift has been from OER, production of, of the products, to focusing much more on the process, OEP. And I That's do want to say, I saw somebody, I think Susan here also from UT said, yeah, there's a, always a problem with grant funding and sustainability. That's really one of the reasons why we developed this documentation process to make that clear of what we can do within a grant cycle. But then of course we have all these <clears throat> legacy projects. So what do you do about that? And we want to kind of recruit our faculty to help us in the long term, not just in the short term to produce a document or a, a, an OER. Y'all, this is outstanding. I, and I want to, I just, we're at the end of the time. So I want to make sure our speakers can get onto their, their next thing. Um, there were a couple of requests for information in the chat and I'll try to pull those, uh, this, the people, some people drop their emails in there. So I'll pull those for you, try to send them to you. Um, but uh, thanks so much for your time and um, really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thanks for being here. It was a big session. There were like 80 people in there at a, at, at a time. So, so well done, y'all. Thank you. That's exciting. Cheers. Thank you for your help. Yeah. Good job, Sarah. <coughs> Thanks, you too. We actually, it actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> So do we need to stick around or should we just leave? Looks like we can leave. <laughs> Y'all can go. Okay, I'll, as oh. soon as I leave, the session will close. <laughs> um, I just want to try to grab a couple of those emails and send them to you. So Okay. Actually, I you're just good. downloaded the chat. So I think. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, you're Thank good. You. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm I also... emails. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, Nathan, I wanted to ask you, are you one of the people who, who founded the Houston like mm -hmm. consortium for OER? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. I think, yeah, it might be interesting to talk to you about that sometime later. So maybe we can keep in touch. Yeah, sure. You know what? I'll um, I we did a uh, we did a talk at the Open Ed uh, conference in the fall. Um, Tanja Connolly and I who developed it, and I'll uh, I'll send you the YouTube on that. But please reach okay. out, like also. Yeah. Okay. Be good to that chat. Good. Okay. Thanks, y'all. All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you.